Hello, good morning, and happy Monday. And then welcome back to our study of the book of Hebrews. We are now in chapter 5, and in the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, and talked about some pretty interesting uh, topics and concepts in that chapter. Now, uh, yesterday when I was at church, um, one of the elders asked me, who do I think wrote uh, the book of Hebrews? And without a doubt, I said, I think it's Paul, because when you listen and you see the writing, it seems as if Paul was the author. Now, nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews, but there are strong evidences that it is probably Paul, the apostle. Okay, so basically, um, we looked at several things, and I want to mention them uh, one at a time before we get into the last thing that we, we uh, we're going to talk about today. And this is uh, basically in chapter 5, from verse 1 through 10, and the, the writer is giving us and is contrasting uh, the Le Levitical priesthood to that of Jesus. Because Jesus, as we saw in chapter 4, is the great high priest, and that uh, he has passed uh, through the heavens, and he's seated at the right hand of God, because he made, after he made purification for sins, God gave him the name that is above every name, that are the name of Christ. Every knee should bow, and every tongue confesses that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he is seated at the right hand of God, and he ministers not in an earthly tabernacle, as we saw, but he ministers in the heavenly realm. And this is where he is, and he has created an access for us. So as a result of Christ and his sacrifices, his, his work on the cross, we have access to the throne of grace. In chapter 4, uh, verse 14 to 16, those verses I said to you a couple of weeks ago, that they stuck with me because the scripture says that because of what Jesus has done, because he has passed through the heavens, and because of his humanity, and because he understands the human experience, we have a great high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So before I get into that, I just kind of want to give you a recap of what we looked at, okay? So let's do that right now. I'm going to try to get my board ready here so you guys can see. Okay, so the first thing we talked about is in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 4 through 6. We saw that Jesus' ordination was superior to that of Aaron, the Levitical uh, priesthood. And then we also saw that uh, in, in 2, last week, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2 and then verse 7 to 8, we linked those. And we saw that Jesus revealed a greater sympathy than the Levi, the Levite uh, priest. We saw that. And then today we're going to talk about, we're going to look at verse 3 and link it to verse 9 and 10. And we're going to see that Jesus offered a greater and superior sacrifice to Aaron. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scripture and then we're going to get into it. We're going to zero in on chapter 5, verse 3 and then verse 9 through 10. Because in these three different aspects we see that jesus completely obliterates and just it is more he's more superior to the levites in every category that we've seen we saw the ordination we saw the sympathy and today we're going to look at the sacrifice so that's what we're going to be doing today okay so without further ado what i'm going to do is i'm going to read the passage and then we're going to get into that so i'm going to read Hebrew chapter 5, verse 1 through 10, as a way to kind of refresh your memory and my memory. And then we're going to get into understanding verse 3 and verse 9 through 10. So let me read on the scripture. Now the scripture says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, 
he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this is the word of God. Please receive it as so. So now we're going to try to dissect uh, each one of these verses. So we're going to look at verse 3. Okay, the, the scripture tells us in verse 3, Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for sins, just as he does for those of the people. And what we've been looking at is the function of the high priest. And then last week, uh, we saw that the one attribute that he had to have was compassion. The high priest had to be compassionate. And the reason why is because the high priest uh, could sympathize with people because he himself was a human, so he could be sympathetic and had compassion for his fellow humans. And, and, and that's because he himself experienced the same weaknesses they experienced. And we talked about how Jesus Christ, on the day, in the day of, of his flesh, he, he uh, also went through the same thing that we went through well, without sinning. So that's what makes him different from the the high the, the priest the Levite priest. So now because of the weaknesses, because of the fallibility of the high priest and and the people uh, he led, the high priest had to sacrifice and had to offer sacrifices for his sins, and that and that of the people. So he he didn't just offer sacrifices for the people's sins because he himself was also beset with sins. So therefore he had to offer sacrifices for his own sins. And we talked about uh, the, the duty of the priest. So he had to, he ministered in the holy place. And when people brought their sacrifices, he he was the one that would take care of uh, them, put it in, in the altar of offering. And that's what the priest did. But once a year, only the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And before he went into the Holy of Holies, he first had to offer sacrifices for his own sins. And that's because he went there uh, to offer and to atone for the sins of the people. That's what he did once a year. I think the day of atonement was called Yom Kippur. So we talked about that briefly. We're going to get into that into detail in the later chapters. But today, what we're only saying is that because the high priest himself is beset with sin and beset with weakness, he had to offer sacrifices for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. So, so God, as we see, instituted the sacrificial system to show his grace. Even before the advent of Christ, God was shown his grace. Okay, even before Christ came and before the subsequent glories on the cross, when he went on the cross and died for the sins of the world, before that, God even made provisions for the people saying, listen, this is a shadow of the things to come. But again, God shows his grace even in the Old Testament. And we'll see in later chapters that the sacrificial system could not expiate sins he couldn't take away sins all he did was served as an as a covering so that people's uh, people could be ceremonially clean that's all he did he could not really take away sins this is why the high priest had to go back every year and atone for the sins of the people every year on Yom Kippur he had to do that because the blood of lambs and goats could not take away sins all he did was serve as a covering in the meantime until jesus himself comes okay so that's what we're going to see later on so people were externally claimed as a result of the, the sacrificial system but the guilt of sin still remained because the blood of goat and the blood of bulls could not take away sins and like i say we're going to look more closely into that but as of now all we see is that the high priest in those days had to offer sacrifices for himself and for the sins or the people and all this shows us is that the sacrificial system was weak and the reason for it is is because it couldn't take away sins and this is why the writer is making that observation okay the people were being tempted to go back to the sacrificial system and we talked about why he wrote he wrote like hebrews chapter 5. see the people were being persecuted and the temptation was to go back to the sacrificial system because that's all they knew. So it was more comfortable for them to do that. And so the writer is showing them here. He's saying to them, listen, don't go back to the old system because that system could not take away sins. It was weak in the sense that all he did was serve as a covering and he did nothing for you. But he showed us, uh, we saw in the last couple of weeks, that Jesus not only had a superior ordination because he was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek we also saw that he was more sympathetic so he's telling them why do you go back to a system that was so weak and that could not really do anything for you 
stick with what I've told you. So he's really encouraging and exhorting the people to not go back to that system because the blood of lambs and the blood of goats could not take away sins. Okay, and he had to prove to them that this system was over with, and therefore he compares it to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And that's going to lead us to verses 9 and 10. So in verses 9 and 10, we read on the following. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's the thing. Jesus didn't have to offer sacrifices for himself because he is without sin. Let me say that again. Jesus, unlike the other high priest, did not have to offer sacrifices for himself because he is without sin. So he entered into the Holy of Holies by his own blood because he is worthy. He is worthy. He can do that because he is sinless, the perfect Son of God. So and we, we established that uh, after that after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We saw that in chapter 1, that after he made purification for sins, because his blood is that worthy, he sat down at the, right, at the right hand of God. And the reason why God sat him there is because he was able to make purification for sins. So he sat down and God gave him the name Son. He said, today I have begotten you. Okay, you are my son. I'll be to him like a father, he should be to me a son. And, and then we saw that in Acts 13, and Paul talks about it, he attributes those verses to Jesus. We're going to see that in a little bit. So we also saw that God gave him the name Son, which I just mentioned. At the resurrection, God glorified the humanity of Jesus by bestowing upon him the name that is above every name, and by sitting him at his right hand. And we saw that Jesus had passed through the heavens. So we also established that. So he didn't have to offer any sacrifices for himself because he is sinless not like the other high priest they were beset with sins they succumbed to sins we saw how Aaron fell he led the people into sin he made a golden calf and then led them to sin okay and we saw that how Eli was pretty much uh, sometimes indifferent to the to the sufferings of the people because he was so callous and we saw that Jesus because he's sinless he he is more affected by the effects of sin in the sense that affected not that sin bothers him in the, to the point where sin is going to do something to him. No, but sins lead him to, com to be compassionate and to understand the human experience because he understands as a sinless human, he is more affected by the callous things that he sees in the world. And that leads him to want to do everything that his father has called him to do because he said, I came to do the will of my father. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. So he came to be the propitiation and the expiation for our sins because the sacrificial system was weak. So in verse 9, so the writer informs us that Jesus has become the source of eternal salvation to all who obey the truth, meaning to all who put their trust in Jesus because he has been made perfect. Now, people may hear that and go, how can he be made perfect if he's already perfect? Okay, so we need to understand what uh, me being made perfect means. See, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, we read something similar. It says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So basically, what it means is this to reconcile us to God. Okay, in bringing many sons to glory to reconcile us to God, it was necessary that Jesus died. It was fitting that he became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. See, Jesus was made perfect in the sense that he was made complete in that way. He was made the complete sacrifice. It had to be this way. There was no other way because if he didn't die, we would not be saved because the blood of goods and the blood of lambs could not take away sins. Only the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, can do that. So Jesus had to die. Remember, we read in Matthew that he said, Father, if it is possible for you, all things are possible. Yet not my will, that will be done. And there was no other way. So he had to drink the cup of the wrath of God. Because without it, we would not be saved today. So the work of salvation was made complete. 
meaning perfect, was made perfect, was made complete when Jesus breathed his last on the cross and said, it is finished. Okay, and we read that in John 19, 30, the scripture said, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. God accepted his sacrifice on the cross and he became the only source of salvation, eternal salvation to those God has called those who obey the truth, those who put their trust completely in Jesus and on his work on the cross. See, the former high priest could not do that because, first of all, we saw that they were cut off because of death. They died. Okay, they were weakened by their own sinful nature and couldn't offer but only a covering for sins. That's all they could do. But when Jesus dies once and for all, and he accomplished an eternal salvation to those who obey him. And verse 10 pretty much gives us like a reminder of who he is. He is a, he is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And we talked about Melchizedek a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to talk more deeply about Melchizedek in, in chapters to come. But as we see here, Jesus' sacrifice was pleasing, complete, and perfect in the Father's eyes. Because the scripture also says somewhere in Isaiah that it pleased the Father to 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 pierce him. It pleased him because he was, he pleased the Father in not the sense that God took pleasure in like, oh, evil pleasure. No, no, no. He satisfied the wrath of God. God said, I am pleased with him. Remember, God always said about Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So when he took upon himself the sins of the whole world, when he died and shed his blood, that satisfied the wrath of God. So this is why Jesus' blood and his sacrifice far exceeds that of the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system. That was not enough. He only covered sins. He never took away sin. He never expiated, expiated sins. See, when, he, when Jesus spread his hand like this on the cross, he mean God took away our sins as far as the east is from the west. God took that away. And the, the sacrificial system was symbolic. He was supposed to show what God was going to do through Jesus. Because I told you on the Day of Atonement, there were two goods that were presented. One to satisfy the wrath of God and the other one to take away the guilt. And you pressed your hand on the one uh, on the one lamb that took away the guilt. And it's, they took him out and sent, and sent it away into perdition. So that's what God does. God took away our sins because of the blood of Jesus. He satisfied the wrath of God, the propitiation. And he also took away the guilt because his blood is that worthy. Okay, this is the precious blood of the Lamb of God. This is why the writer is telling his readers, listen, you go back to the old system, that is weak, and that's gonna not, not going to do anything for you. Because that system is weak, because it was weakened by the, the high priest and by the insufficiency, insufficiency of the blood of Lamb and goat. He could not take away sins. He cannot take away sins. It only served as a covering so that people could be ceremonially clean and could be externally clean. That's all it did. It never took away the guilt of sin. It never took that away. It couldn't. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. So this is why his blood is worthy. And, and because he is the only way. The scripture says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And this is Jesus speaking. So that's what his blood has accomplished on our behalf to satisfy the wrath of God and to take away sins. Only in Jesus there is forgiveness of sins. That's it. There is no other way. He is the only way and he is the only one that can offer eternal salvation for all those God has called and those who obey the truth. And I kind of want to go into on some passages here. I want to go to Acts 13 verse 33 to 40 to kind of solidify what we are talking about this morning. So let me read that first. The scripture says, This he has fulfilled to us, referring to God, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second song, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he also says in another song, You will not let your holy one see corruption. 
For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption or decay. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from, the, from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come about. So what is Paul saying here? So basically, um, I just want to make some comments in, a, in passing. Okay, In verses 34 and 35, we are told about the fact that Jesus rose to die no more, which agrees with what we just read in the book of Hebrews. He died once and for all and he was raised. He will never die again because he's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So his life cannot be interrupted anymore. He only died once and for all to satisfy the wrath of God and to expiate our sins. And after that, this is it. Now he ministers in the heavenly realm. So this is why the sacrificial system is over with. We have a better covenant now in Jesus because he has passed through the heavens and he his life is not going to be interrupted. Just like the high priest, the high priest were dying, but he won't die anymore. He died once and for all for a specific purpose, to satisfy the wrath of God and to take away the guilt of sins. I know I keep repeating myself, but I want you to get it. So he died once for sins and he rose and has been now glorified and his kingdom has been established forever. And we will, we're going to see that in 1 Chronicles 17. See, Paul brings the example of David. See, David died and saw corruption. Meaning, when David died, his body decayed. He was decomposed. That happened to David. So he was buried and he, he was decomposed. When Jesus died, he didn't see decay. He didn't see the decomposition. He, he didn't have, because God did not allow that, because God raised him on the third day, according to the scripture, and glorified his humanity and made him a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. One whose ministry is endless. It will never end again. And I want us to go to 1 Chronicles 17, verse 1 to 15, to see the promise God gave David concerning his offspring, meaning Jesus according to the flesh. So let's go there. Listen. So the scripture says, Now when David lived in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, It is not you who will build me a house to dwell in. For I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up Israel to this day, but I have gone from tent to tent and from dwelling to dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince of my, over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I'll make for you a name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall waste them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. Now listen carefully to the next words. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, this applies uh, directly in to uh, Solomon, but also ultimately to Jesus. Because listen to the next words. He shall build a house for me, which Solomon did. But then listen to the next one. And I will establish his throne forever. This applies to Jesus ultimately. This is what the scripture says. 
he has been established forever. Not temporary. It's not a temporal kingdom that Jesus has. He has a forever, eternal kingdom, everlasting. And listen, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom again forever. And his throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all his words and in accordance with all his vision, Nathan spoke to David. So you can see that from all the way, even all the way to the Old Testament, the scripture always ascribed to Jesus a ministry that is forever because he is after the order of Melchizedek. So his ministry is endless because he has passed through the heavens and his blood is worthy. And we saw that. So what should I say in conclusion? Uh, we can see that the former high priest were weakened by their own sinful nature and couldn't offer but only a covering for sins. Jesus died once and for all and accomplished an eternal salvation to those who obey him. And that, that's all I can say here. Because the former high priest, they could not establish what Jesus did. They could not. Because Jesus has passed through the heavens because of his own blood. Because he entered the Holy of Holies. And when he died, the scripture says, the veil was torn from top to bottom to show that the God himself is the one that tore it. And he said, this is it. Now we have access into the throne of grace. So because Jesus offered a greater sacrifice. These things that we are speaking of this morning are not just for our intellectual knowledge, but it has to transform the way we live our lives. If it doesn't do that for you or for me, then all we are doing is just talking and we, we know the information cognitively, but if it doesn't translate into how we live, then it's just useless information. And my prayer for myself and for you is that as you get into the Word of God, and as you read this thing, it will lead you to your knees. Because we really truly have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. And he is established in the heavens. And the scripture says for us to come to the throne of grace, to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Because we are called to come, because Jesus understands the human experience. He has authentic uh, compassion for people like you and I, who are weakened by our sinful nature. And he has passed through the heavens for us so that we can have access, so that we can ask for help. Don't be proud, I would say. When you need help, go to God and be willing to listen. Now, when we ask God for guidance, we expect things to come to us, maybe in a dream or something. We have his word. So I say start with his word. Start with, by obeying the truth. The word of God is there for our sake. It says the scripture is good for what? For teaching so that the men of God may, th may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when you are struggling with a certain question, sometimes it's not as clear. Ask the Lord for guidance and he will surely guide you because He, the scripture tells us to, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask God who gives wisdom to all generously without finding fault and he will give. But when we ask, we should not doubt. The scripture says that he would doubt like the waves of the sea. And that man should not think he would receive anything from the Lord because he is um, double-minded. We can't have our own mind. We can't have our own plan and just, we want God to bless the plan. We have to submit to his plan. We have to submit to his leadership. We have to come under his authority because Jesus is the high priest. And when Jesus says, go this way, that means we need to go that way because he died. He paid the penalty for my sins and your sins. So how dare we? be irreverent. We have to learn to obey the word of God. And it's a daily thing because we still live in this body. We still live in the in the, this corrupted body. So we are battling every day. For the Christian, life becomes hard because when we weren't saved, it was easy for us to sin because we just did it. It was just our nature. But now that uh, the Spirit of God lives in us, there is a battle between the Holy Spirit and the fleshly nature. But the Holy Spirit always wins because He's greater. But there is that tug of war. There's always like this, 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 uh, this. There are daily decisions constantly. We have to constantly go to the Lord and say, "Lord, is this pleasing to you if I do this?" So Jesus has established that for us. So the only thing we can do as a result is to live in total submission to His leadership, 
All right. So have a wonderful day and I'll see you next week. Thank you.